This is the STEAM Podcast, Strength Through Expressive Arts Mentoring. No matter where you are in your journey as a musical artist, you're always looking to move forward, but you might not know what's next for you. STEAM is about what's next. We're going to give you ideas, conversations, solutions. You have the confidence. This is about strategy. Happy New Year. It's the first full week of 2020. Before I introduce this episode, I want to mention a change in the STEAM Arts Mentoring Podcast schedule. When we launched back in October of 2019, we introduced a weekly schedule between each episode. We are now changing that to a 15-day schedule. Why would we do that? Well, we here at STEAM understand that an important aspect of mentoring is timing. And we want to give our listeners and students more time to digest the information contained in each episode. Besides, we have gotten feedback from listeners on that same point, which was an additional guiding factor in our decision to put more time between episodes. This schedule will allow us to connect with you through the Steamcast Facebook page or through emails you may send to us at steam77cast at gmail.com. So that said, if there was a perfect time to start that new schedule, it would be now because this episode is chock full of valuable information for performers, publishers, and even managers. Even as I listen to it, and I'm going to sound like many other influencers, but I really do wish someone had put this together for me in this way. But that also makes me happy that I can put it together for you like this. So here is PRO's What are they, and what do they have to do with your music? Enjoy. And we are five, four, three, two. Hello, everybody. Hey there, welcome back. Yes. I'm going to get right to it here. In this episode, I want to expand on information to help you further... Uh, benefit from your intellectual property, your creations, music creations. We discussed at some length the importance and the how-to of copyright. So after creating your music and putting it down on paper or getting it recorded, the next most important thing that you can do is to copyright. The next thing that you want to do and that you'll find that you'll need to do is to have an affiliation, affiliation with a PRO. So there are a lot of acronyms that are going to be coming at you. I'm going to try to straighten those out. Um, Some things that you may have heard, some things that you may not have heard, but we're going to talk about what is a PRO and what that means to you and for your music. PRO means a performance rights organization. I'm going to read this to you. Also known as a performing rights society, provides intermediary functions, particularly collection of royalties between copyright holders and parties who wish to use copyrighted works publicly in locations such as shopping and dining venues. Now, that's the result of that search, but you notice copyright keeps coming up. So that is truly the first step. Then you can discuss or go into whatever else you need to do with that material or want to do. So let's pause there for a second and think about what venues, it said shopping and dining venues, that's obviously not the only places that you can perform your music, but let's think about some other places that you may not have thought of. Uh, Sometimes I'm surprised by some of these. We're familiar with clubs, bars, festivals, festivals, uh, restaurants, right, Mm -hmm. stadiums, uh, like a small venue, a big concert hall. Yes. Yeah. And that's where... Your music can be performed by yourself or someone else. Your music can be heard in other places. Well, Uh, I mean, first off, there's the radio. That's right. 
That's right. Let's not forget that. And I mean, the internet and podcasts. Yes. Like this one. Uh, online, radio, um, restaurants, mini marts, gas stations. I know you've probably gone to gas stations and while you're pumping the gas, you've got this music piping through. Um, and when I hear things like that, I think, hmm, I wonder what the resource for that is. <laughs> And I'm thinking in terms of, okay, can I get my music on that? Yeah. And some are familiar playlists of the 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 most the popular music. Yeah, you buy a channel. Yes. You know, you buy a channel and, and, uh, and then broadcast it at your place of business. Yes. So you pay the licensing fees to whoever that is company is that aggregate yes. company is and the licensing fees kind of leads back to our pro and copyright and copyright back again to that film now sync licensing synchronization licensing that is what is used to get your music onto film but your music has to be copyrighted in order to be registered in order to be used and licensed so this is about the money that is connected to the music that you are making. So moving on to PRO, what PROs are there? Now there are two that, especially as an American musician that you're gonna hear about mm, all the time. And those are ASCAP and, and BMI. Yes. And some people are members of ASCAP. Some people are members of BMI. Uh, I myself am on BMI. Um, some are members of ASCAP. Some are members of BMI. You cannot be a member of both. You have to choose one. I learned that the hard way because I applied for ASCAP and I applied for BMI thinking, cool, <laughs> PROs, I'll have two PROs. <laughs> well, I got a letter from both ASCAP and BMI saying, you want us or you want them? You have to choose. So some, I really don't know what I think it's because ASCAP is the first one. It was founded in 1914 um, by Irving Berlin and Victor Herbert. That was very interesting to Whoa, me. Whoa, no kidding. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> February 13th, 1914 was when they were um, established. Oh. Now let's talk about ASCAP, just what it means, because you're going to realize that they both do the same thing. But ASCAP means American Society of Composers, Authors, and Publishers. And according to this, is an American nonprofit performance rights organization that protects its members' musical copyrights, there's that word again, by monitoring public performances of their music, whether via a broadcast or live performance, and compensating them accordingly. So, theoretically, you're supposed to be able to get the money from performances of your music. They don't hunt that down for you. You have to go to them and you have to go through the proper channels to say this is what I what was performed and this is the music that I've copyrighted. It has to be copyrighted works. It's like, okay, you wrote a song, but where's the copyright for it? You have to have that. Now, BMI means Broadcast Music Inc. Um, collects license fees on behalf of songwriters, composers, and music publishers, and distributes them as royalties to those members whose works have been performed. Now, they were founded in 1939, so quite a bit after ASCAP. I don't, I'm not saying choose one or the other. 
Yeah, I, you know, personally have BMI, but that situation I was talking about having done both, and BMI was what I decided to stay with. Mm-hmm. Well, I've got a question sure. now because as a traditional musician, I don't, I don't have any copyright well just i'm not a composer i don't have any copyrighted music and generally what i'm playing is is in the public domain because we don't even know who the authors are and it was written in the 1800s or early 1900s a lot of the tunes are documented in in some collections from 1901 you know so we Mm -hmm. know that those are definitely in the public domain Mm -hmm. um but my question is if you're going to if if you're going to choose one of these companies what kinds of questions should you be asking yourself as you're re- doing your research well are you the composer or the author sometimes with something with in public domain you you really can only copyright your rendition you can do that because it is public domain if you you could even copyright a sound recording of uh you know or your rendition of or of something that's in public domain um well yeah public domain that 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 depends on how it's i think it's 75 years after the passing of a known composer when it becomes public domain. I think it, w- it was 50 before, mm, but now it's that's gone right. to... It changed a couple, yeah. changed a couple of years ago, didn't it? Yes. Yeah. But you can still, you know, copyright your rendition. If it's a public domain piece, a traditional piece, I've done this with uh, traditional blues, uh, acoustic blues that goes back to Robert Johnson's time and even... Mm-hmm. Um, before that, mm-hmm. there are ways of copywriting those things so that your rendition is protected. Mm-hmm. You can still do that. Um, now, when it comes to the sound recordings of a copyrighted, you can also copyright the music that if you've written it out. If it's public domain, but you have a rendition that you have written out, you can copyright that. Ah, oh, so you can copyright your version of something. That's right. That's right. Mm-hmm. And that, it doesn't necessarily have to be a derivative work, which is a different thing. A de- derivative work is you take something and I, I think there was a an, an artist that did this, a, a portion of a symphony as an introduction to your piece or something mm-hmm, mm-hmm. or a portion of somebody else's right. would sampling be considered a derivative work mm, using it sam- de- i mean i suppose it's it depends not on how really mu- because it's not a full work oh right i see yeah. so a mm-hmm. sample is a sample um but if you put it together it's like you have different photos and you put it together as a collage that you create uh uh to represent it and part of it is someone else's photo or something like that Mm -hmm. and that that gets really sticky (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) but i just slipped into photos but that's the only thing that i could really relate to it uh but sampling is sampling you have to pay someone else for all right Yeah. yeah um a derivative work is you take somebody's work and you put new lyrics onto it, but you oh, still yes, have yes, yes, yes. a certain amount. I have a client who actually took an Irving Berlin tune, mm-hmm. which was written in 1921, and put her own lyrics to it, and then we were copywriting her uh, derivative work. So yes, uh, yes. So I actually so did deriv- know the answer to that. I just <laughs> God, I did that. That was a, that was a couple four or five years ago. That's, that's great. It was, yeah, it was really that's, cool. That's great. I mean, a, a, a derivative work is uh, very 
uh, very viable. Well, it's as it's a really common, I think, in um, in folk music that uh, or church music yes. that mm. that common tunes that everyone would know will then have hymns put to them. You know, that's right. So so that everyone can sing along. So it's like you're probably if you do if you experience any of that, you're probably experiencing derivative works all over the place all over the or place. parodies parodies or derivative yeah. works and you know i mean so. folk tunes lend themselves to popular music because that's but then we're getting we're we're getting into how we listen and how we hear as people and listening and creating in the western music styles yes you know, very true. So, uh, you know, you you have other parts of the world that have a a, a musical a way to do, you know, their music, where their music is is organized, and how they've come across the. I would say the 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 scales and the different sounds mm-hmm. that that they come up with. And you have to be careful going across those lines because sometimes you can do something that has a real, uh, y- you're, you're creating a song. I think Dr. Dre did this. He was creating a song and used an Eastern raga, which is a scale, but it was a in the form of a song, but that was a very religious song. Oh, so he that's, used a religious song to express cool. <laughs> a very secular uh, idea, and he got in. You know, he someone knocked on his door. Hey, can't do that. <laughs> that's 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 one of our rid- religious ritual songs. Yeah. You can't use yeah, that yeah, just because you like the notes, <laughs> right? <laughs> so right. I mean, that's interesting because then uh, the artist in me sort of wants to say, "Well, hey, wait a minute, that's." the whole point of art mm. uh so yeah you can totally run up against those boundaries you can so did he end yeah. up having to to pull he, that he ended up he ended up having to pull it yeah that's, uh, that's as far as i i know I, I didn't hear the song anymore right right <laughs> um that's interesting but, though for yeah. sure well with with um and that's kind of going across cultural lines where music is concerned because you can be, you know, ever so much the artist, but if you are reaching over into another another culture's music development, you have to understand where that, I really like that. And the next question should be, what is that? And the next question should be, how is that used? So... Being an artist is great, but being an artist with some conscience as to how you p- approach other people's music is just as important. You yeah, know? it's it's. I think we've seen that most recently in popular culture it, it, in a slightly different way, but with um, the discussions of cultural appropriation regarding that f- the movie Moana, mm. you know, and um, people wanting to have. Uh, body art and have certain types of clothing um, in Halloween costumes and things. Yeah. And I was like, wait a minute, you're going to use my regular clothes or my ritual clothes as a costume, yeah. you know? And, yeah. and I guess it's kind of the same way if you're trying to take a piece of, of music, mm-hmm. a musical, um, what's the word I want? Uh, motif yeah like a motif uh and and put it in kind of a place that just where it doesn't belong you mm-hmm. know <laughs> or it's, use it's it for your usually... own convenience yeah you know with without without communication with someone from that from that particular genre culture, genre or culture yeah. Yeah. Uh, not necessarily genre but the the you know culture mm. i studied classical guitar but if i were going to do something that really excited me about flamenco i would take flamenco lessons first and uh, so that i understood well you're not just just, gonna jump in there and fake it yeah yeah you know it's like okay maybe in certain situations certain things that people just go you know uh, are you know playing western music not country western Western music, you know, uh, 
cowboy music or whatever it is, you know, it, it doesn't make it cowboy music just because you say yee when you play something. Yeah. So we would probably, in our culture, feel some type of way like, wait a minute, why are they using that? What, why? That doesn't work, you know? <laughs> so that that's one of the reasons that all of these things have been created. So as we move on to... Um, yeah, we should loop loop back into our PROs here. Yes, that was a that, that marvelous was a, little <laughs> a, a, a ethnomusicology discussion. Yes, it, um, it turned out to be. <laughs> um, there is a third and fourth PRO that I want to discuss. One is CSAC. Now, that's something that you've probably heard alongside ASCAP and BMI a little more. I would say uh, a, a, a little more often in the last five or ten years, I yes. guess, eight yeah. to ten years. Mm -hmm. um, and that is Society of European Stage Authors and Composers. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not going to assume that everyone within the sound of my voice is an American musician. If you are not and you are working in Europe... Um, well, if you're or if you're European and come here and perform right. your music here, yes. Uh, originally, the Society of European Stage Authors and Composers is a performance rights organization in the United States. Oh. Since the organization stopped using its full name in 1940, it is now known exclusively as CSAC. Hmm. So. All of these have links that you will see in our in our show notes or in, in our de descriptions. Ascap.com, BMI.com, CSAC, S E S A C dot com. Um, the last one that I want to mention is GEMA. I cannot pronounce those words. The Gesellschaft für Musikalische auf now, that's as close as I can come to it. Und Merchandanisch, very fun. This is um, Society for Musical Performance, Performing and Mechanical Reproduction Rights is a government-mandated collecting society and performing performance rights organization based in Germany with administrative offices in Berlin and Munich. The reason I mention this one is because I have a CD that was produced in Germany with my co-producer uh, and music partner, Nick Katzman. And he took the responsibility of registering this work so I have part of it, he has part of it, and then the publisher has part of it, depending on who the publisher is. So those are the four that I wanted to mention. Now let's talk about portions of your song. There's 200% of a song. So well, what does that mean? That means 100% goes to the songwriter and 100% goes to the publisher. It's really divided up that way. So you can't have it be more than 200%. So you're, you're a songwriter and you're publishing it, you get both 200%. Now, in order to be a publisher, an official publisher, okay, if you're the songwriter and you're the only person that owns this, you have the songwriting and you have the publishing. That means you are responsible for making sure ASCAP or BMI or CSAC or GEMA know that you are using this work and need to be paid for it. If you want to be a publisher, you cannot really be a publisher in name only. You have to be a publisher through one or the other of them. I had to, because I have BMI, be a publisher through them. That costs money. So you had to pay to be a registered artist with them, and then 
you had you have to pay to be, to be a publisher. A publisher. Yes. So is that like an annual membership? It is a one or time a one time fee. Okay. Uh, it's pretty expensive. At the time that I did it, it was two hundred and fifty dollars for an artist for the for an or for the publisher. for the publishing company. Okay. Okay. I'm. I decided to do. I have Winslow Productions, so I decided to do Winslow Publishing. And so, so did you, did you... Uh, went through the did whole you, process. Are you trademarked that or... No, or I, you, it, uh, it's, it's... DBA that registered. or something? Uh, registered, okay. and I yeah. And I did DBA it, but before I DBA'd it, I made sure that I went through the the application process and paid you mean for with it. BMI. With BMI. So you did mm-hmm. that first, and then you went. So you just go to your county uh, yes. offices, your te- your county clerk, I believe, mm-hmm. or is it or registrar? Anyway, it's the county clerk. County clerk, yeah. So and you go to your county clerk's office, and they have a form that you fill out, and in order to be DBA, which is doing business as. Yes. So that means that you can. Um, you can open a checking account, you know, if you have a DBA, which, uh, you know, in our area, I think it costs $25 yeah. per DBA. It, it it may be slightly different in other places in the United States. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, you go and you fill out a form. Uh, you, first, you need to do a search and make sure there isn't anyone else with that DBA mm-hmm. um, so that you're not infringing on anyone else's rights. And then you file with them for $25 and they send you a certificate. I think it's yeah. what it co- takes a couple weeks to do or something. And yeah, then you I... have to take that form around to any place where you, you know, open a bank account or get a credit card or whatever. Yeah. If you want to do, if you want to have a business account, yeah, you know, mm-hmm. um, it allows you as a sole proprietor to do it as your own personal or to do it as your business. So you have a, a, a dual, um, you know, we're getting into tax stuff. And, yeah, we don't, yeah, we don't, yeah, we don't need to do, <laughs> but, but the point is we're talking about DBAs and that, that is an important step when you're, mm-hmm. you know, w- when you're dealing with a PRO, you want to have all of your paperwork in a, you know, lined up and ready to go. So that's, that's just right. a piece of it to protect yourself again. Mm-hmm. So now, um, I don't think I mentioned this. Uh, broadcast music and BMI was founded in 1939. Yeah, no, you did I, talk about that. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, so those really are the main points. Uh, especially I wanted to end on the one about publishing and being the publisher because you can't just say you're a publisher. You have to actually be a publisher. Okay. And which, the only way to officially do that is to be registered through the PRO. That's right. So they have to acknowledge you as a publisher in addition to being a, a composer or a songwriter. Yes. Uh, that present or author that's presenting this work. That's right. Okay. Now you can still have the publishing as the songwriter because nobody's publishing it but you. It's just I wanted to have a publishing company in case I wanted to build a library with other artists. Mm -hmm. And that would um, make them feel confident that I had a publishing company that was really a publishing company. Mm -hmm. Now, there is something that we wanted to go back to. Traditional music, playing traditional music in um, venues that, you know, don't present any other type of live music right right um you know it's protecting the the session and i'm an irish musician i haven't said that before i don't think but um Mm -hmm. i we play traditional irish tunes yeah um and the the only thing i would say about that is let's say somebody wants to use your version of of one of those tunes for a movie then if you don't have it copyrighted, then you're going to run into someone else having to do the copywriting and the publishing and then splitting it more ways than you want. However, sometimes that is beneficial too because you just don't want 
to be bothered with it because it is quite the process. Mm -hmm. I think that's what we were talking about, the process of registering your works and making sure that you get paid for them. BMI, I know this specifically, ASCAP may have, have it too, BMI Live will pay you for your set list if your music that is copyrighted is on a set list. That's why so many people, so many artists come out with so many songs because you want to be paid for your originals. If you have sound recordings that you are also copyrighted, uh, that's still copyrighted material. Now, that's for any set list that you have, and, and you know what a set list is, your program for your gig that's written down. You make a copy of it, you send it to them, and then on the 21st of every month is when they send out the royalties. So that is really important. The other thing that is important, BMI Live, speci BMI Live specifically, uh, house concerts don't count. They don't pay for house concerts. Um, you have to let them know what the gig was and the set list. So you have to give them that information. I wonder if ASCAP charges for or pays for house concerts. I'll have to ask around. Yeah. And, you know, if anybody listening happens to know that, shoot us an email over to steam77cast at gmail.com because I'm curious about that. I, um, having hosted house concerts myself, and uh, I also write visas for artists that come from Europe to perform. Mm -hmm. Um and house concerts are on a lot of their uh, itineraries. Yeah. So because, you know. And that may go with what you were saying before, that house concerts, that's not really considered a venue that they're charging a yearly fee for. So that's kind of how you can get around having the venue that you perform being charged that fee if you do house concerts. So that... If it's a, what would you call it, a, a, a venue that is licensed as a public venue, that's where the charges come in. Right. But a house concert is not a public venue. It's not, they're not licensed. Nobody has a, a you know, alcohol license or whatever mm -hmm. it is. Right. Um, and therefore, I'm thinking... I'm guessing that ASCAP would not pay for that. But I don't know. I don't know specifically. We'll find out for another episode and we'll come back to it and say, hey, yeah. you know that question that we had about ASCAP? <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think, I, I think that might answer, maybe not satisfactorily, but it might answer why they would charge the venue, you know, that you're performing in for any live music, um, regardless of whether it's public domain, it's still, they could probably say, well, it's still, you know, Library of Congress, <laughs> you know, whatever, yeah. <laughs> you know, but yeah. that's in the United States. Now, these yeah. are traditional Irish tunes that were written in Ireland. That's another yeah. issue there, too. Right. You know, so yeah. uh, we're, we're, we're setting up a whole court case or something you know <laughs> i mean it can get really my point is it can get really complex when you have questions about those things and you want them answered and they should answer them you know um so maybe that's something that you can research too why is this this little um public house being charged for our performances you know right so, right. yeah, but that I uh, will conclude my ideas. I mean, there's so many other ways, as you can hear, there's so many other ways of going about this, um, and so many other things that you 
can do, but go to BMI.com, decide if that's the one you want, or go to ASCAP.com, decide if that's the one you want, mm -hmm. or CSAC. GEMA, that would not make any any sense, any sense yeah, if you're American. You're, yeah, unless you're you know. going to go be an expat in yeah. the Schengen or something. Yeah, <laughs> you know? which is what Nick was. Nick was an expat, so therefore he was uh, responsible for GEMA. Mm -hmm. Um and which was kind of interesting. I was like, oh my goodness, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you're registered in Germany. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so uh, that's exciting. And it is, uh, it, 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 uh, so that is the next step after your copyright. Make sure that people know where your, um, your music is and be able to get paid for it when it is used, whether you use it or someone else does. Yeah. Excellent. Great job, Thomasina. That was a lot of uh, really interesting and a lot of fun. Well, I'm hoping that it, that it helps. And again, you can email us. Steam77cast at gmail.com. Yes. And we will answer any questions that we can or you can give us any answers that you run across. Yeah, please share your experiences and expertise with us so we can um, give everybody more information. Uh, this is a community that, you know, we're all constantly learning. And I think that's why we're all musicians. We're really interested in the world and we're interested in sharing with each other. And we here at STEAM want to make sure that that's a reality. That's right. Really important to us. So thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thanks for joining us again. And we will see you on the next podcast. Goodbye. This podcast is a part of the STEAM project. STEAM, Strength Through Expressive Arts Mentoring, is a registered trademark and a subdivision of Winslow Productions. Reserved.